Hello and welcome to the History of Vikings, a podcast featuring scholarly discussions about Vikings, Norse myth, and the history of medieval Scandinavia and Iceland. Before we begin today, let me just encourage you to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play Music, or wherever you get your podcasts from. When talking about the Viking Age, it is impossible to go without mentioning the Old Norse sagas, stories of gods and humans, great battles, feuds among powerful families, and so much more. Well, joining me to share his expertise on the Old Norse sagas is Old Norse specialist and translator Dr. Jackson Crawford of the University of Colorado Boulder. In the description of this episode, you will find links to his excellent translations of both the Poetic Edda and the Saga of the Volsungs. And in fall of 2019, you can look forward to a new standalone edition of the Havamal, including the full Old Norse text with expert commentary and translation. So definitely keep your eyes and ears peeled for that. Dr. Crawford, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me again. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. Yes, I'm so, so glad we could get you back on the show. Well. You know, a lot of people talk about the Old Norse sagas, and perhaps for those who aren't as acquainted with them, when compared to the medieval literature of other societies, I know this isn't quite medieval, but a lot of people are keen to contrast the gods of the ancient Greeks and Romans to those of the the Norse. What is different from the Old Norse sagas when compared with other literature? Well, first of all, let's define what we mean by saga. So, in Old Norse, the word saga actually has a very general meaning, as it still does in Icelandic today. It really just means story or history in uh, Old Norse or modern Icelandic. It's derived from the same root as the verb sekia, meaning say. And actually, the word saga has a cognate in English. If you've ever heard someone, maybe an older person, see, say, uh, tell an old saw, S-A-W, meaning a, a story, that is the uh, cognate word in English. Um, so in Old Norse or in modern Icelandic today, uh, when you say saga, that can have a very uh, different meaning from what we mean when we're talking about it in this context on, on the show. Um, so for instance, you go to a bookstore in Iceland and you pick up a book called Saga Islands. Uh, that looks like Iceland's saga, but it really may just be a history book because saga can mean both true and fictional narratives. But what's happened in the last couple hundred years is in other languages, we have borrowed this general Norse or Icelandic word to mean a specific Norse or Icelandic phenomenon. And so in technical usage in English and, and uh, some other languages, uh, we use sagas to mean, and let me give you these five criteria, and then I'll, I'll sort of hit each one briefly. They are a number one, they're, they're a long prose narrative about human beings in Old Norse. So we got five things there. Long, number one. Prose, number two. Narrative, number three. About human beings, number four. In Old Norse, number five. So let me talk about this a little bit. Typically, the word saga is reserved for um, novel or novella-ish length narratives. There are also shorter prose narratives that survive from Old Norse. Um, the Old Norse word uh, for that is a thotr, or thread. It's modern Icelandic, thotr. And, uh, the, the sagas, uh, you know, there's not, I think, like a hard and fast length criterion for them, but they are typically, um, you know, 30,000 words or, or so or more, uh, whereas a thotter might be quite a bit shorter. It might just be roughly the length of a chapter or two in a modern book. But they are also, and this is an important distinction to make, they are prose, right? So in most of the ancient or medieval world, including, uh, for that matter, in Old Norse, the literature is poetry for the most part. And this reflects a couple different things. One is that in an oral society, poetry can be transmitted from generation to generation or from reciter to reciter in the same generation more faithfully than just plain language, than just prose, right? It's easier to remember um, structured language like poetry because there may be meter, a rhythm, alliteration, rhyme, whatever particular characteristics that society uses in its poetry that helps people remember it, helps them transmit it more faithfully. But also because poetry takes a certain amount of defined art to create, it often has higher status in ancient and medieval societies than just regular language prose does. So if you look at something like the Poetic Edda with uh, narratives about 
the Norse gods or narratives about Norse heroes. It's still not technically a saga because those are still being told in poetic form. The sagas are really distinct and really unusual as ancient or medieval literature in that they are prose, right? They're just written like a modern novel in quote unquote plain language. And that is something really special and unique. Now, they often include poetry, right? A speaker pauses. Uh, to, to to recite a poem before he, uh, he he goes off to fight his last duel or he recites a poem to insult an enemy or something like that. But the main narrative, the main thrust of the story is in prose. So third criterion is that they are narratives. Uh, that's fairly easy, but it means that something like, say, Havamal is not uh, a saga. In addition to the fact that it's in poetry rather than prose, it's not one continuous story. The sagas have at least um, to have a continuous narrative from beginning to end. Sometimes that continuous narrative may be a little bit different from what we would tell because sagas often wander down um, sort of, if, if you use RPG terminology, you know, side quests, right? You know, uh, we, we depart from the main thrust of the story, but there's still a chronological order to the story from beginning to end in, in one generation or sometimes across several generations. Number four criterion is they're about human beings. So uh, the myths of the Norse gods are not technically sagas. Sometimes the gods participate in the sagas, particularly in the saga of Volsungs, um, the saga of Hereborn Haderach, the saga of Rolf Kraki. Those have gods participating sometimes, but they're not the central focus of the story. The sagas are human-centric. And then number five, our criterion, they're in Old Norse. Uh, I mainly insert that criterion to distinguish them from something like Beowulf, which sometimes people call a saga because uh, it has somewhat similar uh, cultural background, similar style in some ways but it's an old English work and not part of the same culture that produced the sagas. All right, so those are my criteria. <laughs> that's, this is, that's, that's kind of a, a summation of, of, of what I, I present at the very beginning of my class on Icelandic sagas that I teach at, at uh, Colorado, previously at UCLA, um, Berkeley, uh, to define the, the subject material uh, that we're moving forward with. Yeah, well, that's very thorough, and I appreciate that. Well, you know, you mentioned the five criteria of basically what makes up a saga. I'm curious, is there any clear-cut way to distinguish different types of Old Norse sagas, say a family saga, a legendary saga, or something like that? Oh, absolutely. And um, and, and I have a whole sort of uh, half-serious uh, <laughs> uh, metaphor for this, which is it's as as you change the channel on Saga TV, the uh, the different genres of saga are kind of your different channels. So if we go through that, uh, we might first turn onto the 700 Club or something like that. And these are our bishop sagas, Biskupa Sogar. So these are some of the earliest sagas, and they concern the naturally the bishops of early Iceland. These are sort of heroized. Uh, Christian clerics, uh, either during the transition to Christianity or fairly shortly thereafter. And these stories are not necessarily the most interesting for the most part. There's fun moments in a couple of the bishop sagas. Um, you know, sometimes they will literally fight monsters like, uh, you know, there's a there's Sel Kola, which is this woman with the head of a seal. Um, there's one of the bishops I wish I could remember which one off the top of my head, but he's kind of a prankster and he has a uh, Dutch assistant who doesn't speak Norse very well. So he keeps telling the guy uh, insults and his Dutch assistant goes and says this insult to some, you know, random Norseman on the, on the street and he gets beaten up for it. So he's, it's kind of, kind of, kind of fun uh, prankster humor there. But these sagas aren't particularly fascinating narratives uh, for most of us today. And often they're about half miracle books. Uh, so after the bishop dies, we have an effort to get him uh, beatified or canonized. And so we have uh, just these pages after pages after pages of miracles attributed to him. But these are important um, as early roots of the saga tradition because uh, they probably come, probably part of the, the, the origin of these is in uh, medieval Latin uh, vitae, right, the lives of saints. Uh, which typically are in prose. And so it may be that those prose saints' lives, which which inspire these uh, Icelandic bishop sagas, are part of 
what kind of gives the impetus to to writing these other narratives about less less clerical material in prose in a similar way. So if the Bishop Sagas are our 700 Club channel, we change the channel, we see the History channel, and that's more like the King Sagas, Komunga Sogar. Now, in these sagas, um, many of which are very interesting, uh, we read reasonable attempts, especially reasonable if you're talking about somebody like Snorri Sturluson, a little bit less reasonable as you get into some of the later sagas about especially some of the early Christian kings like uh, Olaf Tryggvason and, and St. Olaf Haraldsson, uh, but reasonable attempts at, at creating kind of a dramatic history, a historical fiction. Um, uh, the, the most famous collection of king sagas is Snorri Sturluson's Heimskringla, which begins with Inglinga Saga, the uh, mythical ancestors of the uh, Norwegian kings, who are, of course, um, first and foremost, the Norse gods. And then uh, Heimskringla has a individual saga about each Norwegian king from the uh, father of the first unified king of Norway. Uh, so the saga of Holt on the Black, preceding the saga of Harold Fairhair, and then all the way through to the king in uh, Snorri's own time. He was a little bit of a suck-up to the Norwegian kings. And uh, these sagas include a ton of skaldic poetry. Uh, very often that poetry actually does appear to be much older than... Um, the age of the saga itself, suggesting that people have been passing down these poems um, for a couple centuries even sometimes, and that they're being incorporated into the sagas as a way of kind of legitimating the saga narrative, right? Uh, the same way that if you were writing a history about World War II, you might include a bunch of quotes from Winston Churchill or Franklin Roosevelt or George Patton or something like that. These sagas uh, quote poems to kind of uh, give a sense of, of the words of the time that they're, they're writing about, which may be 300 or so years before in the case of something like Hames Green, we'll talk about, say, King Harold Fairhair. Uh, somewhat similar, we change the channel again. We might get to the National Geographic channel this time, and this would be a little bit like the sagas of exploration. Uh, that is a term uh, that I use for a couple sagas that sometimes are included as sagas of Icelanders, um, but that really have their own themes. Or, or their own their own kind of structure is fairly different, and that's Eric the Red Saga and the Saga of Greenlanders. These sagas, of course, concern the uh, exploration of uh, what is now the uh, maritime provinces of Canada by Vikings around the year 1000. You could also kind of look at something like uh, Ingvar's Saga Vithforla, uh, dealing with travels in the east, is a little bit of a saga of exploration, but it's it's got some more mythical uh, heroic elements to it. All right. Then we might change the channel and see an old-timey sword and sandal and sorcery kind of movie. And these are the chivalric sagas, the Ritara Sogar. These sagas are often translations of or adaptations of um, Arthurian romances from English, French, or German. Uh, later on, um, Icelanders make up their own uh, chivalric saga is an imitation of those Arthurian works, so you get, you know, your 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 Sir Thorkell of the Round Table, that kind of thing. Uh, these stories tend to be a little bit predictable, at least from my perspective. You know, a lot of knights going off to woo and save princesses and fight dragons and and that sort of thing. But they were very popular in their time. You know, this was the uh, these, these were the blockbusters of the Middle Ages. But the two genres that people most think about when they think about sagas are the um, mythical hero sagas, the Four Nobler Sogar, and the sagas of Icelanders, the Islandinga Sogar. So the mythical heroic sagas, the Four Nobler Sogar, these are like your superhero movies. These are, you know, your Superman, your, your X-Men of, of the uh, medieval Norse. The most prominent example of this would be the saga of the Volsungs, a uh, Volsunga saga where we have um, human beings who are um, maybe descended from gods, but often at least, you know, a little bit unbelievably superior to us. Right? You read about someone like Sigurd that are in the saga of the Volsungs. He's handsomer, stronger, a better fighter, smarter. He's everything better than any of us could be to the point where it's not even believable. But the point isn't to be particularly believable. 
he's kind of a Superman figure and he's going to fight dragons and the God Odin is going to help him sometimes. Um, he's he's going to harvest people directly in the saga. Sometimes there's going to be wizards. There's going to be dwarves. Um, you know, the hero, uh, Sigurd, for instance, the saga of the Volsungs has a sword made by a dwarf, a lot of supernatural elements. These are similar to, but different from these sagas of Isenders, the Eastland thing is solar. These are more like your Westerns. So if Saga of the Volsungs is a Superman movie, um, Kiesley's saga, uh, a classic saga of the Isenders, is a John Wayne movie. The hero isn't supernatural. He doesn't have, he's not, you know, impossibly strong, impossibly handsome, impossibly smart, impossibly um, you know, strategic or something like that, but he's very good at everything, right? He's, he's a, he's still within human bounds, but he's, you know, one of the really, uh, top, top people like someone, John Wayne or, or, or Bruce Willis or someone would portray just at the edge of believable in terms of his capabilities. There may be magic in, in Sagas of Isenders, but it's typically marginal. Someone puts a curse on somebody. Um, it's not clear if the curse necessarily works uh, as directly as it might in something like a mythical hero saga. You know, is, is, is the curse actually what's causing him to have bad luck or is, he, is it a self-fulfilling prophecy? Um, you typically don't have things like dwarves and dragons, although you may have those things at the very, very margins. And uh, the, the action is still fairly, like, over the top. Um, you know, it's, you're, you don't have people with basically superpowers like you do in the Four Elder Silver. But, um, you know, the fights always last a little bit longer than they probably would. The hero always kills a couple, sometimes a dozen more people than he believably would. Uh, that, that kind of thing. Uh, typically, especially in the 19th and 20th centuries, when people were very judgmental about these things, uh, the Isanding Asogar, the sagas of Isanders, were considered much superior literature to the uh, more mythical sagas. I'm not sure if that opinion is still held very widely today. After all, these are all produced by the same culture. They reflect a lot of the same um, cultural truths and practices. But um, certainly the sagas of Isanders are a little bit more sober than the Four and Elder Saga. And the last genre I'll mention, because it kind of spins off of the Isanding Asogar, is the contemporary sagas, the Sam Tidar Sogar, one of which is confusingly named Isanding Saga, Saga of the Icelanders. But if, if, if the sagas are being written in, in, roughly speaking, the 1200s, the sagas of Icelanders are about the Icelanders' great ancestors in the 900s, the people who settled Iceland back when it was a frontier, and men were men, and the women were beautiful, and everything was settled with a duel, and everybody was honorable, and you know, very much the same kind of romance as, as Westerns have for, uh, uh, for an American audience. But the contemporary sagas, what they're actually writing about their own time, are much grittier. Whereas in the sagas of Icelanders, you have uh, heroes fighting duels and, and you know, quipping in skaldic poems at each other and, and that kind of thing. In the contemporary sagas, you have somebody dragging somebody else out of church and cutting his ears off and people crying and things like that. It's, it's much grittier because they're much closer to it. It's more like a, an, an account. Of, it's more like an eyewitness account, but it's still narrativized in a way very similar to, uh, to the sagas about older times, the sagas of Icelanders. Yeah. Well, you know, and I suppose this would depend upon the genre of saga you're discussing, but what was the primary purpose for the, the composition of these sagas? I mean, like the poems of the Eddas, are these were these narratives um, older than the periods of primarily the 1200s when they were written down? You know, were these written? Um, some might argue that, for example, say Egil's saga was uh, written down by uh, Snorri Sturluson, or was the uh, work of Snorri Sturluson were these written for um, a way of you know keeping track of history for political purposes? Does it really depend as to why these sagas were written down? That's a good question, and, and one that people have, have argued about for, for some time. I'll focus on, on the two big genres, the mythical heroic sagas and the sagas of Icelanders. With the mythical heroic sagas, often those are written a little bit late. Um, 
Bull Sings is fairly early, written down probably about 1250. Uh, but something like the saga of uh, uh, Roland Crocky is getting pretty late, uh, late 1400s or, or so, if I recall correctly. Definitely the language is pretty late. But often the material in those mythical heroic sagas is much, much earlier, as we can tell from references to uh, some of the Volsung narratives in something like Beowulf, which is from somewhere between 800 and 1000 AD, um, and other old English poems, and, and the way that uh, Volsung narratives are depicted in art from the Viking Age on, um, on stones such as the Ramsund carving. Uh, so we know that, that the Volsung narrative goes back many hundreds of years. In fact, if you uh, listen to someone like me nerd out about the, the dating of Eddic poems, uh, two of the oldest poems, the, the two oldest poems in the Poetic Edda are two of the Volsung poems, uh, Adlakvila and uh, Hamnismol. So even though the saga is being written down in about 1250, at least parts of it are based on poems composed probably in the 800s. And even with something like the saga for Old Kraki, which is quite late, there's references to people who are also mentioned in Beowulf, again, establishing that at least some of the material of the saga is much, much earlier. With the sagas of Isendries, you're in a somewhat different position. Some of them are just totally made up out of whole cloth. Um, if you look at something like uh, the saga of Ravenkill, Priest of Freud, Ravenkill's saga of Freuskoga, uh, for a long time, people thought that this was a, a, a work of history, essentially a nonfiction work because it was so detailed in its depiction of place. And um, it was only demonstrated in the mid-20th century by Sigurd Nordahl, one of the great saga scholars, that no one mentioned in Hravenkel's saga had ever existed. They're not mentioned in any of the works that we know to be uh, relatively nonfiction, like Lan Noma Book, Book of the Settlers. And just because a saga is very detailed, very believable in its depiction of place doesn't mean that the things that it says happened actually happened in those places. The same way, you know, because the saga authors are often very, very knowledgeable about Iceland. They know every rock and every gully. The same way I could write a fiction story about Clear Creek Canyon, Colorado, where I grew up, because I know, and I know where every rock is and every tree and, and all of that. Um, and I can make it very believable, but I can make it about people who have never existed. The Hravenkill saga conspicuously doesn't include any quoted skaldic poems. And I mentioned before, and this is true of the, the sagas of Icelanders as it is of the, the king sagas, that skaldic poetry, sometimes very old skaldic poetry, is quoted in the sagas to legitimate the narrative, to, to sort of quote that past that's being described. And sometimes in uh, an Egil saga that you mentioned is a great example of this, the skaldic poetry that comes up in the saga actually looks, by ling linguistic criteria, to be from the time that the saga is supposed to be taking place. Um, Egil's poems in Egil's saga, the saga is written in probably the 1220s, but the, uh, the alliteration, for instance, in some of those poems wouldn't work in the 1220s, but it would work in the 900s, suggesting that, in fact, these poems have been passed down for about 300 years. Now, whether they were passed down it, whether they were originally composed by somebody named Egil, who did all the things in the saga, isn't clear. I mean, right, that can't be demonstrated. But it at least suggests that there is an actual, there is a history to the narrative, whether the ultimate origin of that narrative is historical or not. But you also see, uh, on the other hand, something like the saga of Gunlau uh, Wormtung, Gunlau Saga Ormstung, the uh, poems, that, that, that's another saga that's full of poems. But those poems, alliteration shows that they're actually being composed at the same time the saga is being written down, right? They would not have alliterated correctly in um, the early 1000s when the action is supposed to take place. And this is part of why it's valuable for people who study the literature to know the language well enough to date these things. The same way that, you know, you wouldn't believe that, uh, that a book was written in the 19th century if it used like the way that somebody uses like in the 21st century. In a similar way, you can tell from the language if something is actually as old as it's supposed to be. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. That's really interesting. Are there any common themes that occur throughout the Old Norse saga? Things that might provide a historical insight into sort of the culture of the people behind these narratives. For example, 
this is just the thing that comes to the top of my head. If one were to read uh, the Divine Comedy by um, Dante, you might notice that all of the people who end up in uh, the Inferno of Hell happen to be of Greek ancestry, clearly because Dante was uh, Italian. That is Roman. That is a reflection of sort of his historical character. Do we see anything like that, um, providing any insights as to sort of who the, the Norse were from reading their sagas? Well, I think you can get a lot of cultural information out of the sagas. One question you always have to ask yourself, am I seeing something that tells me about the culture of the people who wrote the sagas or the people that the sagas are written about? Um, you know, in the same way that if you watch, well, you can, it, it, here's something that just occurred to me. You can watch True Grit from, I think, 1968, and you can watch True Grit from 2010. And even though they're basically the same story and they're set in the same past time, the sensibilities of 1968 are pretty different from the sensibilities of 2010. So they may both be stories about the 1870s or, or 1860s, but because of the time they're being told in, that story has changed. Um, you know, even though a lot of these narratives are much older than the calfskin they're written down on in the 1200s, it's still the 1200s that's telling us this story. So we always have to be a little bit cautious with that. That being said, uh, there are some really interesting cultural uh, assumptions, narratives, traits, beliefs uh, that shine through here. One of the most prominent is uh, luck. There's a lot of different words for luck that get used in sagas. Gava is one, Hamingya, uh, Gifta. Uh, and these words occur again and again and again in a sense that's much more tangible than the way we talk about luck in uh, English today. Luck is is it's, it's almost like every character in the saga. If you think about an old-fashioned, you know, a Sega Genesis game or something, I, I, all of my video game references are older than 2002, <laughs> so maybe this will do this. But you used to have a little bar above every character that showed how many hit points that person had left, so you could watch how much health they had. You know, they get hit and their health goes down a little bit. In the same way, it's like every character is running around with a little luck bar that shows how much luck they've got. And, and, and your luck can actually be high or low, and things can affect whether it's getting higher or lower. So if you're, yeah, so if you're random, everyday Joe like me has, say, 10 luck points to start with, a king has maybe 100 luck points. And one of the things that happens when Europa Saga goes and, and meets the Norwegian king is often the king seems to shed his luck on him a little bit. Uh, he gets luckier from having been in the presence of the king because the king's huge amount of luck points kind of recharges your luck points if, if yours are, are running low. And uh, the king can actually give you, he may give you a physical gift, he may give you a cloak off of his back, he may give you a sword, a ship, something like that. And he seems to sort of shed his luck like dandruff upon these gifts that he gives you because they also replenish uh, your luck. So it's, 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 it's kind of a funny, uh, like I said, more tangible sense of, of luck than we have. And you, you read so often in the saga something like, um, I knew I couldn't defeat him because he had better luck. And that, doesn't, and that seems like a strange cop-out excuse maybe in, in a modern English language context, but in their context, it reflects a more serious belief that somebody simply has a great amount of, of these, these luck points, to put it in that way. Um, the closest thing I can think of in a modern English language context is, is Breaking Bad, where um, Jesse says that Walt is, is luckier than you, and it means something a little bit like it means in the sagas. He's just, no matter what happens, the dice are just a little bit loaded toward him. And um, when you're outlawed, your luck goes down. So, for instance, in uh, Geesley's saga, one of the, the really classic sagas of Icelanders, uh, Geesley's luck is, is remarked upon as going down after he is outlawed. And you actually see this played out, right? He, he, he manages to uh, pull off a pretty, pretty difficult, pretty complex murder early on in the saga before he's outlawed. But after that, his plans just don't go that well. Um, Partly, maybe there's a curse on him, but it may just be that his his luck is literally running out, like it's a like it's a spigot that starts leaking from you when you're when you're outlawed or other bad things like that happen to you. Um, 
you know, other things that come up that are that are that are very prominent uh, or prominently distinct for a reader in our culture is the way that family works. And Geesley Saga is another great example here. Uh, Geesley is married to Ewther, whose brother Vestain is Geesley's best friend. So he's best friends with his, his brother-in-law. And uh, Geesley's brother Thorkel gets jealous because he learns that his wife uh, used to like Vestain, Geesley's brother-in-law. And so at some point, to make to make a long saga short, as it were, um, Gysi wakes up and finds Vestain has been murdered. Obvious assumption is that his brother Thorkel has murdered him because he's the one who's jealous of him. But there is nothing more illegal, more morally wrong in the saga universe than hurting your own blood family. So instead, Gysi kills another brother-in-law that his brother is fond of. Right? He's he's returning the injury to his brother, but he's not hurting his brother because nothing could be more unthinkable than actually directly hurting his brother. And this is what eventually uh, precipitates him being outlawed. Now, along the way, um, the sons of Geesley's friend Vestain, who were murdered, actually do kill Geesley's brother Thorkel, who probably was the murderer. And Geesley's wife actually won't let them stay at the house with her because she knows that if Geesley finds out that they're there, he'll kill them, right? They avenged his best friend, <laughs> but they did so by killing his brother. And so by saga morality, he absolutely can't stand for that. And the brother-in-law that he, he did kill is married to uh, his sister Thordis. So Thordis wants to get her, her husband avenged. And so she has her new husband uh, hire men to go out and pursue Geesley, and they pursue him for seven years. He's an outlaw hiding out for, for seven years. He's finally tracked down and killed, and the man that uh, she hired to avenge her husband, now she tries to kill him, right, because he killed her brother. Um, you know, so she, he, and, and, and Geesley complains while he's on the run that his sister is prioritizing her married family over her blood family, right? She's, she's willing to avenge her husband on her brother, which she considers absolutely morally wrong, and it probably is uh, from from saga morality. If you compare something like the saga of the Volsungs, uh, at the end of that, Guthrun uh, avenges her brothers by killing her own children and feeding them to her husband, and then killing her husband because her husband killed her brothers. She's willing to stand to take a stand against her married family for her blood family. Um, but the, the, the bonds of loyalty to the people that you were blood related to, especially someone as close as a sibling or a parent or a child, uh, are absolutely unbreakable. And that's part of the central track. You know, Gisa Saga is almost, a, almost an overdone example of this because there's so much conflict around it with siblings, you know, at each other's throats. But they can't literally be at each other's throats because they can't. That's, that's the worst thing they can be. So they end up killing all these other people around them. Um, but Njal Saga has some of that too with conflict, uh, between foster children. And, that, and that's another place that comes up is, is between foster children and, uh, legitimate children of, uh, one person. A lot of the conflict in, uh, Loxdale Saga and the Saga of the People of Loxdale is also built around uh, a similar conflict to that. Interesting. No, that's fascinating. Well, I'm trying to ask this question without sounding too basic or shallow, but you know, when reading the sagas, I often find myself hypothetically saying to myself, well, you know, that's pretty metal. There's a lot of violent occurrences and very extreme violent occurrences throughout the sagas. Is there any, you know, theory as to why this is? I mean, you know, were the Vikings in, well, by Vikings, I mean the medieval peoples of Scandinavia and Iceland, were they, you know, inherently violent in nature? Are there any theories as to why this is? Well, the, the, to start with, I know what you mean by metal. Um, I, I keep going back to Geesley's saga, but it's just, it's been on my mind lately. Um, at the very end, when he's tracked down by his pursuers, um, he's holding them off on a ridge top. One of them finally rips Geesley's guts open with a spear. Geesley takes a cord, ties his guts back into his abdominal cavity, speaks a poem, and then leaps off the cliff with his sword pointed down and pierces the head of one of his attackers while he himself 
falls dead. And I mean, the guitars are just wailing at that point, right? Just, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's very metal, uh, very rock and roll. Um, you know, so I think, I, I think there's sort of two answers to this. One is that action is a pretty inherently interesting thing to most human audiences, right? I mean, we, we still, we, 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 we still spend a lot of money making John Wick movies, right? We, we like seeing people who, who can really capably uh, fight. It's just, it's, it's, it gets the blood pump and it's, 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 it's fun to watch, fun to hear about. Of course, the medieval Norse society, uh, not to say, not to say Vikings, uh, so specifically were, uh, sometimes people say martial. I think sometimes that, that word can make you think a little bit too much of a very organized soldierly society like the Spartans. I prefer a term I once heard hyper masculine, which is that you know, the men are expected to be always ready to fight, especially to defend their honor, their family's honor, their family's survival. And um, there is a great virtue attached to being ready to fight, very capable of fighting at any time. And just an expectation that any man is going to do this. And any man probably has some, some violence in his past. And, and if he's younger than 60 something, probably some violence still in his future. Um, you know, they're not soldiers. Right, these really aren't stories, and this is another thing that's a little bit similar to westerns. You rarely read a western that's about an organized military force. Instead, you're reading about the gunslinger who's out on his own. Uh, you know, the cowboys on the trail run into rustlers, something like that. It's rarely about organized fighting forces, and it's very much the same as the sagas, where it's typically the the man alone or the the couple of brothers or friends alone um, who are standing up to to violence and doing violence in turn. I think that that makes for an interesting contrast with some other violent literature from ancient and medieval world. Uh, for instance, you read about, uh, you know, the Iliad is about armies fighting, right? The Aeneid is about a soldier. Um, many of the characters in um, in plays by, say, Euripides, if their action uh, characters are, are are soldiers, but that's really not the case with our Norse. Uh, action heroes, they really are more like, again, those Western heroes where they're maybe not necessarily quote unquote ordinary men, but they're not part of an organized fighting force. They're men that are that are fighting for survival, fighting for honor, fighting for vengeance. But at the end of the day, if they get their way, they'll probably go back to their farm and pick up their <laughs> pick up their farm and implements again. <laughs> yeah. That that makes sense. You know, that's an interesting way of, of looking at it. And um yeah, I really appreciate that because I've often wondered about that. Well, the last question I'll ask you today is this. And again, I suppose this would depend upon the genre of Old Norse saga, but how does one go about using a saga as a historical source for the Viking Age? I mean, are there certain sagas that we should think of as purely historical fiction? Um, I think most scholars are pretty nervous about the idea of using the sagas as sources of history. I think as sources of historical culture, they may well be useful. Again, that historical culture may be more like the 1200s than the 900s. Um, but as sources of history, fairly nervous. There's a continuum here. Uh, Snorri Sturluson's uh, King Sagas in, in Heimskringla are uh, pretty well researched, pretty well uh, within believable bounds in terms of, of numbers of, in armies and things like that. There's not a whole lot of supernatural occurrences. Um, and a fair amount of what he says can be substantiated by more historical works or by archaeology. Um, two, two sagas that, that provide kind of an interesting case study a little bit further along the continuum toward fiction are the uh, sagas of the exploration of Vinland. Uh, so you have the Saga of the Greenlanders and the Saga of Eric the Red. The Saga of the Greenlanders is probably composed about 80 years before the Saga of Eric the Red. It's probably about 1200. The Saga of Eric the Red is probably about 1280. And in these two sagas, you see a lot of the same events discussed, but in the earlier saga, the Greenlanders, you see this, those events discussed in a much more um, believable way than they are in the saga of Eric the Red. And so what it looks like has happened is that in the intervening generation, somebody has gotten a hold of the saga and added a bunch of elements, um, either just for pure storytelling entertainment or out of a belief that, oh, this happened in some exotic place. I also heard this other thing that happened in an exotic place. I'm going to have that happen in Vinland, right? They're going to run into this guy who's hopping around on one leg like a pogo stick. Just, just pretty ludicrous stuff like that. But 
uh, at the core of something like the Saga of the Greenlanders, uh, you can find very realistic descriptions of a landscape that's clearly not Scandinavia, clearly not Iceland, clearly not Greenland, that has a lot to recommend it for possibly being a description of, of Newfoundland or, or Labrador or maybe New Brunswick. Um, you have realistic descriptions of, um, of, of a, a human culture that's clearly not Norse or Celtic or anything else that they're used to encountering. Uh, people whose material culture sounds believably very much like that of American Indians. Um, so there's there's a core truth there that is also supported by some archaeological evidence, the excavations at Lansom Meadow in, in Newfoundland, for example. But already, even in the earlier saga, in the saga of the Greenlanders, it's very uh, it's very narrativized. It's very um, it's it's just like you know, if you make a movie about a historical person, you're likely to add add in and emphasize the most exciting parts. Something very similar has happened there uh, with, for instance, um, a good example would be uh, Freudy's, uh, I think she's Leif's uh, sister, who uh, kills a bunch of women uh, during one of the expeditions to Vinland. And it's just, it's told in such a, a dramatized way that even if it's based on something that really happened, it didn't happen you know, that way it didn't happen with that many one liners. Right. You know, that's but that's part of the that's part of the saga writing style, just like it is our style, right? Um if you made a movie about my life, right, it might be based on a lot of things that actually happened to me, but you'd probably have me uh, you know, getting a lot more cool quips in <laughs> and you'd probably make you'd probably make the fights you know, a lot more, a lot longer and more dramatic. Um, you'd, you'd probably, I don't know, play up the the, the, the ridiculous romances. Uh, you know, add in things to try to just generate more human interest. So even if it's based on something real, uh, especially after generations of storytellers have have, have had it passed their lips and then pens, um, you know, it's very unlikely that what you're reading is is, is a transcript of a historical event. And I would say, on the whole, and there's a lot of different ideas about this, and people are going are gonna to disagree about this for centuries more to come, but I would say that on the whole, what you're looking at is, is fiction, very similar to the genres of historical fiction of today. Again, I think the sagas of Eisner's are very similar to Westerns, um, sometimes with a core historical truth to it. For instance, um, Njal's saga. One of the really long, really dramatic sagas. Of course, one of the most dramatic things that happens is the burning of Njal, and that is told in a in, in a, a, a series of chapters perfectly worthy of a Hollywood movie. Um, and I severely doubt that anything like that went down in just the way described in the saga. But there was a burned farmhouse at roughly the site where his house was supposed to be, uh, that was burned roughly in the time that he would have been burned. So what's to say, how can we possibly say that someone didn't get burned to death in his house somewhere around there, sometime around then, and over the next 200, 300 years, people, you know, kept embellishing with details. They added a lot of cool one-liners, you know, some some neat fights, and it just became uh, a story that's, um, you know, 80% fiction, but there may be a 20% that we can never get at. That actually reflects something that actually happened, maybe even to people with different names than they have in the saga that we have. But it's just like it's just like stories about our own family members today. I mean, I, I mentioned if you made a movie about me, you would emphasize a lot of the most dramatic events. I've seen this happen in in my own lifetime with uh, my great uncle Jack, who was kind of a kind of a real life action hero. Um, he he was uh, he served two tours in World War II, and uh, just. You know, a lot of amazing stories about this guy. And I heard a lot of his stories from him when he was still alive. And in the 19 years that have passed since he died, I have heard a lot of other people tell those same stories. And they get more Hollywood every single time that I hear them, right? The quips get better. The characters get fewer, right? Because all of a sudden, it doesn't matter that Jack distinguished between, you know, his buddy Andrew and his buddy. McCabe, now they're just conflated into one friend character or something like that. That's something that actually doesn't really happen so much in the sagas. If anything, the sagas have too many characters for us, right? We, uh, this is something, this is something I, I struggle with every semester when I'm teaching a sagas class is helping people 
figure out which characters to pay attention to because the sagas are so full of names. But still, you know, over time, it's very easy for for two more or less background characters to merge or something like that. Um, for somebody who's originally, you know, more marginal to a narrative to become more central to it or vice versa. Uh, and I'm sure the same thing's been happening for hundreds of thousands of years in terms of storytelling. Yeah, yeah, that's a good uh, distinction and comparison. That makes perfect sense. Well, Dr. Jackson Crawford, thank you so much for joining me today again on the podcast. It's a real treat to be able to uh, speak with you. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, folks, you will find a link to Dr. Crawford's translation of the Saga of the Volsungs, the Poetic Edda, and his splendid YouTube channel in the description below. But Dr. Crawford, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Noah. And uh, yeah, talk to you next time. Thank you all so much for listening today to the History of Vikings podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play Music, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Join us right here next time.